All right, what's going on, everyone? Thanks for tuning back into the channel today. I'm Zach Davis. I want to say uh, happy Resurrection Week to you. This is the week that we celebrate Christ Jesus rising from the dead. And I think it's by the sovereignty of God. Some of the things that I discussed in Sunday school, even this last uh, Sunday school lesson that we talked about when we talked about the death that Jesus Christ defeated. And I've had a lot of positive feedback on that message. And I think a lot of people who maybe don't see our paradigm uh, maybe the way we understand it yet or coming around to those conclusions. And I just want to talk for a second about my approach as to how I'm going to keep talking about this death that Jesus defeated. And I want to make note of how it is connected to Satan. So Satan's connection to the death, the death and Satan are going to be defeated at the same time. And naturally, I think what I've shown, and um, I pray that you can see it, is that in some way or another, whether Satan is strictly Old Covenant Israel or whether Satan is directly a spiritual being connected to Old Covenant Israel, that there's no separation between Satan having the power of death, Old Covenant Israel being the ministry that held that death and the one that held them in bondage to that death and Jesus Christ setting them free from that death. And what this does for you, it really causes you to ask the questions and, and challenge some presuppositions that you've probably had. Because I grew up in, I think, what most people would call just the normal traditional setting of church. And one thing that was always instilled in me was Adam physically died because Adam broke the covenant and Adam sinned in the garden. So physical death was always part of the curse. Well, during my journey, one thing that was major to me that connected a whole lot of things for me, and really David Curtis' feast days um, really helped piece that together for me. If you don't have his book, I would go check that out, uh, the seven feasts of Yahweh. And they were gracious enough to let me write a recommendation in front of that book. And so go check that out because that's that'll really transform the way you think about a lot of stuff. But the death that Jesus defeated was connected to the defeat of Satan and to that old covenant system. Well, so what my approach is going to be here at, over the next however many weeks or months that this is going to take, because that's what Hebrews is about. Christ's work on the day of atonement, defeating that death and those who had the power of death. And that involves his new priesthood and the changing of the guard. What I'm really going to show is how all of those New Testament texts, because people keep bringing up John 5 and John 6 and 1 Corinthians 15, specifically Christ as the first fruits, to prove that Christ's physical death and resurrection is what defeated that death. And I don't think that is the, the picture at all. So when we read passages like Matthew chapter 16, Jesus points and says, a wicked and adulterous generation seek a sign. And he said, no sign will be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And that's obviously the resurrection. Now, I want you to stop and think about that for a second, that Jesus calls the death and resurrection, what Jonah experienced, the sign. And, and friends, we understand signs well. If I come to uh, a sign on the interstate that says Cracker Barrel, I don't pull over at the sign. The sign tells me where to go to get to the Cracker Barrel. The sign points me to a greater reality. I don't stop at the sign and eat at Cracker Barrel. I look at the sign and recognize where it's telling me to go so that I can go experience the reality of the biscuits and the pancakes with that good maple syrup and that bacon that's real floppy sometimes. Unless you eat at the one in Jonesboro, they burn the bacon all the time. But anyway, the sign is what points you to the reality. So when we think about Christ, and his death on the cross, a lot of people are looking at it saying, well, hey, Christ is the first fruits. He physically raised out of the ground. Well, there's a couple connections that I would want to make on that. And Philip Kaiser is one who really pushes this argument. And I, I enjoy Kaiser's work. I think he misses it in some places. He's been really hard on the hyper preterism movement. And I'll be honest, I've been really disappointed in him. About two years ago, we had an exchange online where I just laid out some of the problems exegetically with his position. And he said, Zach, I'm not even going to address any of those. And then he gave me about a thousand words of a creedal history lesson. So that's disappointing when things like that happen. But I want you to think about just one thought here. Christ's physical death, if what he's trying to do as a substitute, if his physical death means that you and I will never die physically and Christians still die physically, if Christ's work is finished, as so many people will say, then he failed as to what he was trying to do. But it, when we say that Christ is the first fruits, that is a feast day connected to old covenant Israel. That's a feast day that's centered and connected around the law. And if the law no longer exists, then how can Christ fulfill the fullness of the harvest pointing to tabernacles at the end of the 40 years, by the way, 8070? How can we separate 
Christ as the first fruits from the rest of that old covenant system. And if that old covenant system is no longer in play, then how can Christ fulfill first fruits, the fullness of it, tabernacles in mine and your future? And the answer to that is that he can't. So when we think about first fruits, the idea is not that Christ was the first one to physically come out of the grave. Friends, Christ is not the first one to physically come out of the grave. And if that was the intent that Christ is the first fruits, that those would never die again, then those who believe in him should never physically die. But we do physically die when we believe in him. But there's a sign in Christ's physical resurrection that's pointing to something that is a greater reality. And that greater reality is that Christ was separated, forsaken. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That he was separated because of our sin that was placed on him. Sin was placed on Christ, even though he was perfect. And the reality is that he, that separation, he was the first one to come back fully into the presence of the Father. Therefore, as the first fruits, the fullness of that resurrection pointing to 8070 is that those also, James 1.18, who were the first fruits, by the way, those who were living, Think about that. Those who were living were already called the first fruits as well with Christ because they had experienced passing from death, separation from God to life. So how can Christ be the first fruits of a physical resurrection and those who were living be called the first fruits and they had never physically died yet? You've got a massive contradiction. What that's pointing to in the fullness of tabernacles is that those dead saints also would come and they would be raised and they would all be restored to the presence of the Father. And now me and you, when we believe, we experience that same resurrection, that we pass straight from death to life, that we believe in the Lord, we come into fellowship with Him, we've been raised because Christ has defeated the curse. So what I want to do and prove in all of these New Testament texts is that they are tied to the end of the age in the old covenant system. And that's why the resurrection happened there for them. And what that means for me and you is now we come when we believe into the fullness of what Christ has done. Friends, Jesus was not trying to defeat physical death. If that's what he wanted to do, he could have done it. I believe that he's God. I believe that he's all powerful. He could have done whatever that he wanted to do. But I think we've missed the boat and we've assumed the curse in Genesis 3 has physical death. Therefore, we've got to the New Testament and we've had to force passages like 1 Corinthians 15 that clearly tie you to the defeat of death, to the defeat of the law in the old covenant system. And we've had to force them into our future because we've misidentified the death. So what I want to do is walk through all of these passages over the next couple months. And I want to demonstrate that people like Philip Kaiser are missing the boat on first fruits because they don't understand the spiritual nature of the death that Christ was defeated uh, and what that means for me and you. So I pray that's going to be helpful and beneficial. If you take anything away from this, remember this, guys. If they're saying Christ's physical death and resurrection was the idea of the first fruits, pointing later to a physical death and resurrection, and that's going to be the fullness of it, then why could James 1.18 say that the living saints were also the first fruits of that harvest if they hadn't physically died? That's massive contradiction number one. I'm going to demonstrate a lot in 1 Corinthians 15 over the next couple of months. I'm going to have a video on John 5 and John 6. That'll be coming out soon. Uh, I'm going to continue some Revelation stuff. I've already released the first uh, of the uh, members only deal, and I'm going to release one of those about every two weeks. So next Monday, I'll release another members only deal. It, if you want to support me on Patreon or on YouTube, please feel free to do that. Guys, you don't have to support me on both. Some of you are doing that. That's not necessary. I'm going to post them on Patreon and on YouTube for the members for the Revelation series if you want to get those uh, that extra members-only exclusive stuff. But anyway, I hope this is enjoyable. I'm looking forward to posting so much stuff, guys. I, people are, are giving such a good response. I've talked to people in about 12 states just this week and uh, just really excited about what's going on here. So. Uh, thank you guys for your support, and I pray that we can see a, a biblical understanding of what Christ Jesus did for us. Guys, it's not about eschatology. It's about what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us so that me and you aren't born into the covenant of Adam. We're not born under that death. We pass straight from darkness to light, and we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we bring people into his kingdom that's growing and that never ends. I pray you'd celebrate the resurrection this weekend. Even if you don't go to church somewhere, I pray that you'd go find you a place to go worship the Lord in and be around people that even though they may not understand it all like we do, that you would go worship with them and make God known and, and sing to him and, and make him glorified and make him known. We've got a play coming up tomorrow night at our church. Uh, the Last Supper play is at I. Looking forward to that and just uh, partaking with the saints and some of that. So God bless you, and we'll see you soon.